This is the final study in our series on the book of Ephesians in the Bible. It is such a timely message. The Lord certainly knows what we are dealing with and what we are all going through. Now, this is going to date the message, but it gives us some context. The novelty of this virus is wearing off. It has been six months since the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 outbreak a public health emergency of international concern and in March, a global pandemic. Here in South Africa, we have been on lockdown state for 121 days and it is taking its toll. Our thoughts and our prayers go out to those who are, are grieving, the thousands who have lost uh, loved ones to COVID, uh, well over 6,000 in South Africa alone and over 633,000 uh, recorded deaths globally. Uh, these are modest e estimations. In reality, many more are not being recorded as COVID deaths. Uh, the Medical Research Council says that there are 17,000 extra deaths uh, to, to the same time compared to the same time last year that cannot be accounted for. So there is a lot of grief around and very high levels of fear and anxiety. Uh, fear uh, of you or those you love contracting the virus. Uh, there is tremendous fear and uncertainty about the economic impact of COVID. Uh, people are losing their jobs at alarming rates. Uh, businesses are struggling to stay open and having many having already closed. Investments such as pensions are suffering and our currency is weakening, making things even more expensive. Almost everyone is working harder to make less for less. And the uncertainty is causing so much stress. Our children and young people are feeling it with all their disruptions to their schooling and to their relationships with their friends. There has been a marked increase of stress, anxiety and depression over the last few months with little hope of relief in the foreseeable future. It may well even get much worse before things can get better. And of course, this is causing so much despondency and, and hopelessness in many people. Even suicidal thoughts and tendencies among South Africans and certainly around the world. This is seen in the sheer volume of calls that are received by call centers and, and counseling facilities such as Helpline uh, for depression and anxiety. Uh, their numbers have more than doubled since the beginning of the lockdown. And it is growing daily as the negative effects of COVID and, and lockdown take hold both physically and emotionally on people. There is a mental health crisis. And to make it worse, uh, in this time of such great need, we are in isolation from each other. It's hard to reach out and, and to be reached in a meaningful way at such a time as this. You see, we are created as relational beings and we, we need human interaction. Now, this might seem like a, a rather gloomy introduction, but it sets the scene for our passage. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 21 to 24, the very last section in the book of Ephesians. Let me pray for us before we read it. Heavenly Father, we do uh, pray and thank you, Lord God, that you have given us your word, Lord, which is timely for every season in life, Lord, which speaks into our situations, Lord, like no other book there is, Lord. It is certainly your eternal word to us, Lord, and we thank you for it today, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that you would speak, that your Holy Spirit would enable us to understand it, to receive it uh, with glad and sincere hearts, Lord, and that it might leave its mark on us, Lord, as changed individuals, changed more into your likeness and more for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read for us from uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 21. It says, Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters. And love with faith from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ 
with an undying love. That ends the book of Ephesians. The personal nature of these final few words gives us much insight and, and opens a window for us into the world of the early church and the kind of church it was, the way that they related to one another and the way that they cared for each other as believers who are in the Lord. Now, Tychicus was more than just a messenger, but we are told was a dear brother to Paul and a faithful servant in the Lord. Now, as we know, Paul is in a Roman prison. He's in a dungeon, estranged from the churches he loved and cared for as a pastor. But this isolation and suffering that, that he was in did not dampen his love or concern or service to these churches, as you can see from the whole book of Ephesians and other letters that were written from, from prison. Certainly not by this final greeting. You can, you can tell from this how, how it had not in any way affected him uh, negatively in the way he was caring for his churches. The sincere relationships that existed and the, the partnerships that they were as they worked together are truly remarkable. Uh, Paul was not alone and the church was not abandoned, left to fend for themselves because of Paul's incarceration. And it is important for the church today to see and to recognize this in the situation that we find ourselves in, in these difficult times in which we are in. The church is not closed, nor will it ever be, by whatever adversity or challenge that might come her way. She will never close. The scriptures assure us of this, and history confirms it. We will never be overcome. All we have to look forward to is our final consummation as Christ returns to fetch his bride for the final wedding supper. Now remember that the early church was a suffering, persecuted church, outlawed and oppressed on, on just about every front. Uh, they seldom could meet freely in public gatherings without fear of, of opposition and, and persecution. And this was the reason why Paul was in chains, why he was in jail. But the gospel through the church continued its advance, touching lives and changing people for good, transforming the social fabric of society through heart and mind conversion as people put their faith in Christ and as the church grew in numbers and spread geographically. It was not just through the efforts of Paul or the other apostles that this took place, but ordinary everyday believers, Christian believers like you, as we meet in the person of Tychicus. Already the church is showing its global reach and the cosmopolitan nature of the early church, what we would call the missional nature of the church, a church without borders, transcending class and gender and race distinctions. For in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3, 6, 26 tells us, you are all children of God through faith and are all one in Christ. Now this doesn't take away our unique identity and the diversity of the individual within the church, but it gives it character and color as each part does its work. Now, Tychicus is mentioned in another four places in the Bible. We first read of him in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, as being an Asian from the churches in Asia and among those who accompanied Paul towards the end of his third missionary journey. He was Paul's messenger to the Colossian church in Colossians 4, verse 7, where he's mentioned, and another, which was again another prison letter written, and to them, he is also described as a dear brother and faithful minister. The Colossians adds that he was a fellow servant with Paul in the Lord. He, he's also mentioned in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 12, and again in Titus 3, verse 12. So he was clearly an active figure. Although we see and we find no position is assigned to him, he is a minister without an official title or portfolio. Simply, he is a dear brother and faithful servant. Now, this should speak volumes to you in terms of your relationships 
and your Christian service. Paul was betrayed and deserted by many people. But Tychicus, uh, mentioned here, shows that he was faithful to the end in those last difficult days. He was there for Paul, serving the church on Christ's behalf, doing what Paul could not do himself and visiting the churches. He was a messenger, and a messenger was an important function in ancient times. Uh, imagine our world today without all the means of, of communication that we have. The person sending a message made sure that they entrusted the message to an, a reliable and a trustworthy person. You didn't want them to distort the message for personal gain or to serve their own agenda. We know at the time traveling was difficult and a dangerous thing to do. Uh, sailing or and traveling on foot exposed you to the elements and to robbers, to, to wild animals and dangerous seas. So a messenger had to be tough, had to be determined, having perseverance to get the job done and to do it right, despite all the obstacles and, and all the opposition that they would face. So Tychicus, we see, was an ordinary uh, believer, but one who played a very important role in the early church that was under extreme pressure at the time. As you may be an ordinary believer, living in very extraordinary trying times that we live in, you need to see him as an example for you to follow. His role was to deliver the message and to tell the churches everything. His faithful character was why he was chosen to go, because he was the right guy for the job. He, he had to be faithful, and, his, and in his conduct, it was a it was challenging and it was an important task. He had to get it right. As servants of Christ, our duty is, is not to hesitate in proclaiming the whole will of God, as Acts 20:27 20, tells us, but to be faithful in telling others about the love of God and what God has done on the cross and what God is doing in your life and that of others. Not to add to or take away from the message entrusted to you, but persevering in your efforts. Paul wanted the Ephesians to know how I am and what I am doing, not because he wanted sympathy or to complain about how, how difficult his life is or was back then. It wasn't a pity party of sorts. His concern was not inward for himself, but for the needs of others. He states his purpose of sending Tychicus to tell them everything uh, that, that was so that you may know how we are and that you may be encouraged, that, that he may encourage you. Now, as you know and have experienced, God is faithful in every situation. He had a story to tell that must be told, as do we, of God's faithfulness. It is important to see this loving care in the life of the early church as a benchmark standard for the kind of care we should have for one another, even as individual Christians and ordinary Christians, that we care for and encourage one another in the faith, to stand strong and to not lose hope in our trials, to see it as an opportunity to care and to show the love of Christ among us. Ephesians 6 is not the only place that you find the armor of God mentioned. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, it says, Let us put on faith and love as a breastplate and a hope of salvation as a helmet. It says he died for us so that we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. End of that verse. Caring to encourage is a universal call to every believer. As we go through trials and tribulations in our fights, we must encourage each other as a soldier in Christ, particularly as the battle is fierce and as the war wages on. Now, part of what is necessary for any good military campaign is motivation. Commanders will encourage their soldiers and fellow soldiers will encourage each other to fight on in battle. This is done by being reminded of and knowing the enemy and his strategy and knowing the cause for which they fight, knowing their ideals and the strategy of their own army 
for which they are fighting. So it is vitally important for the church to know how Paul is, what he was doing, and what he was going through, or they may become discouraged and give up all hope and sense of reason for which they should stand. They would have been tempted as we are to give up and to surrender to the enemy in the heat of battle. But the key to overcoming our fear, our sorrow and despondency is found in knowing what God has done in Christ as revealed in the letter, in the word of God. It helps us to understand what God is doing today as he works out his purposes. It is in caring for others to encourage them that your own difficulties are put into perspective and will not easily get you down as you involve yourself in the hardships of others, as you endeavor to encourage and to care for others. There is such a thing though, of course, as, as care of fatigue that is experienced by those who take care of others. And it can cause anxiety and, and depression and irritability, tiredness, burnout, and even serious health issues. The sense of being helpless to change and to fix situations can affect your state of mind and your, your walk with the Lord. So it is important in our caring and in encouraging others that we remember that it is in the Lord and it is He who does the real work. He is the Prince of Peace and the only true giver of peace. Otherwise, we will take too much responsibility upon ourselves to fix things and ultimately burn ourselves out. Caring must be done with a healthy understanding of the sovereignty of God and knowing His purposes. Some things you cannot change, and they will not change, and they have to simply be embraced as they are to experience the peace of God in that storm. Feeling sorry for yourself, or for others for that matter, seldom helps anything, but showing love goes a long way. And this is why proper caring takes place within the context of a loving church community where people care for one another. There is mutual edification which takes place. As Paul was cared for by the churches and those who were close to him, those who were, who were around him, he also cared for them. It cannot only be a, a give-give or a take-take situation. There has to be a give and a receive. Brother, let me be your servant, and may God give me the grace to let you be my servant too. So the peace, the grace, and the love that comes from God that, that Paul refers to here in his closing benediction is no trite cliché to end off his letter. It is the very foundation of what Ephesians stands on and the focus of his final prayer for the Ephesians, as we have seen throughout the book and now summed up in these four key words, peace, love, faith, and grace, which we read of in these closing verses. First of all, let's look at peace. It says in verse 23, peace to the brothers and sisters. Now, peace is ours as brothers and sisters, as believers. It is a, a true gift from God. It is a peace with God through the reconciliation that Christ has made possible by paying for our sins on the cross. We receive a peace of mind and peace within our hearts, as well as we receive peace with one another as we live in harmony as brothers and sisters in Christ's family. We are at, at peace with each other as the family of God. It is a prayer, though, because peace is not always a reality. Every family has its moments as uh, when peace is broken by conflict. And the family of God is not exempt as we wrestle with our, our fleshly sinful natures and, and, and its evil desires. But we must work hard and pray for peace. Second of all, Love with faith from God, it says. It is God who has poured out his love into our hearts. Love comes from faith in God. The two go together. You cannot have the love of God if you do not have faith in God. Your faithfulness 
is because of the love of God that is in us towards Christ and the people he has created. Both faith and love come from God the Father and is received through Jesus, our mediator, to us of, of every spiritual blessing that we have in him. Thirdly, grace. Verse 24, grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love, it says. All that we have, every spiritual blessing in Christ, is by the grace of God. Grace has been the thread that has run throughout the letter of Ephesians. From the beginning we read of it, and now at the very end, and it forms a, a central theme throughout the letter. This grace is, is for all who love the Lord our, Lord our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is, of course, such a thing as general or, or common grace, which is given to all. The creation that we have can enjoy, sunshine, food, life, air, rain, is given to the righteous and the unrighteous, according to Matthew 5.45. But it is only the believer who loves our Lord Jesus Christ who can receive and know and appreciate the full measure of God's special grace to us that we have received in Christ. This gra grace is an immortal, incorruptible love that we, of, of God that we have received. And this gives us great assurance of salvation. We shall not be overcome as Christians, whatever may come our way. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, according to Romans 8 verse 35. His love for us is certain. It is fixed. It is immovable. It is an undying love because Christ has overcome death. Because his love is in our hearts, our love for him stands firm. Our love for one another stands firm. The love of God is in our hearts. Permanently, it may be shaken as we are tested. It might wane at times as we drift away from him in a state of rebellion. But we are assured that those who are in, in him will never fall away. And it will never be taken away from us. Because verse 8 of, of chapter uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, Love never fails. Certainly God's love will never fail us. Ephesians calls for a response into Christian action, even in the most trying and difficult times. It calls us to be faithful servants of the Lord, to be a community that loves and cares deeply, sincerely and intentionally, a community of God's grace that serves to encourage each other in the faith. And this means that we must be a people who pray for each other and a people who connect with one another by whatever ways we have available to us. We have never had as much and as many means of communication available to us through technology as we do now, even if we cannot meet in person. So I challenge you to take up this call. This, to, to reach out to others in, the, in love and to show that you care enough to encourage them. When the Lord puts someone on your heart, don't hesitate to contact them. Find out how they are and how you can pray for them. And as you do so, you will find such blessing in that. You will find such joy and peace and love in doing that, that simple act of kindness. The Lord may lead you to do all sorts of things for others. And as you do so, you will find the joy that there is in serving the Lord, in serving others. And as you do so, may he encourage you and may he strengthen you in your efforts. And may you find his will at your fingertips. May you find his, his desires that, that he wants from us something that comes easily and naturally to you as you seek to serve the Lord. May the Lord use his word in our hearts to, to show genuine love, genuine care for one another, especially in these difficult days in which we live. 
where we are all feeling the, the pressure. We're all feeling the heaviness. We're all feeling the weight of what we are in. May we think more about the needs of others and put the needs of others ahead of our own, reaching out in love and caring for one another. And as we do so, we will mutually encourage one another and strengthen one another in the faith. And we will get through whatever we have to go through in the days that lie ahead. So may the Lord encourage you, may he challenge you, may he direct you, and may he help you to live out his word, to put his word into practice, and to go now and to do his good will. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you again for your word to us today, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, the blessing that it is to be able to read it together and to consider it, Lord. And Lord, it has challenged us deeply today, Lord, to, to not simply hear the word, but to put our faith into practice in the relationships that we have with one another, Lord to reach out and to care for one another, Lord, to not be selfish and only think of our own needs, but rather to put the needs of others ahead of our own. We know, Lord, in doing that, there will be blessing, there will be encouragement, and we will find the strength that comes from you to do what you have called us to do. Lord, you will never call us to do something that you do not equip us to do, Lord. And so we do pray, Lord God, that you will help us to do your good will, and that, Lord, when you return, that we would be found, Lord, doing your good will and hear those wonderful words which you, which you promise us. Well done, good and faithful servants. Here is your reward. So, Lord, help us, Lord, to go and to be your good stewards, to be your good servants, Lord, of all that you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Thank you for listening. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his the face shine upon you, may he give you his peace as you go about serving him in your daily lives. Amen and God bless you. When peace like a